Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Kimiko. I'll be co-presenting with John Gillick. We focus on the poetic aspect of laughter as opposed to comedic aspect of laughter. We would like to start with the sound of laughter. In the next few slides, we invite you to listen to the sound of laughter. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> As you listened, you might have been remembering the laughter of your loved ones. Laughter is an essential part of our life, yet laughter is ephemeral. In this project, we started with a vision of making laughter less ephemeral and considering it as something that we want to hold on to. Two sets of questions drove this research. The first concerns with the process of capturing laughter. Many aspects of our daily life can already be tracked and quantified, walking, sleeping, being stressed, etc. What might be gained by capturing and possibly quantifying laughter, like other dimensions of our health and activity? And what forms of representation should our laughter take? How might we interact with such representations? With whom and in what context? Technically, this led us to develop a machine learning algorithm to automatically detect laughter. OK, so I'm just going to give a really high level overview of how our uh, machine learning algorithm for uh, laughter detection works, just to give a, a general sense for people who are not too familiar with uh, machine learning for audio applications. So I'm going to actually use the task of speech recognition as a, a point of entry, um, since this is a much more common task that people might be familiar with. Um, this technology is in your phones, it's in your devices that you use every day. And it's actually quite similar to what we use for um, detecting laughter from uh, audio files. So, um, so our goal was to um, pull out short clips of laughter from long uh, recorded audio files. So, um, so this is a somewhat oversimplified uh, version of a typical speech recognition pipeline. So we start with an audio signal, and our goal is to convert it into a sequence of words. So the, the first step is to extract a sequence of uh, features from the audio. These are based on the frequencies and the formants of, uh, of a voice. Um, we then have an acoustic model, which is typically either a neural network or, in older systems, a hidden Markov model, which maps the features to a sequence of phonemes. Um, these are the sounds that make up words. Um, and then we have another piece of the system, which is called a decoder, um, which is informed by a language model, which tells us um, what words we're likely to see. Um, and the job of this part of the system is to put the sounds together into a sequence of words that makes sense, that would have, we would have been likely to hear. Um, so modern uh, state-of-the-art speech recognition systems um, often actually combine these steps together to map directly from uh, a raw audio signal to phonemes or words. But um, these tend to require really large data sets, um, more than we have access to right now. So uh, we use basically this typical um, standard system. So. Um, a common problem in speech recognition is in disambiguating between utterances that sound similar. So um, by combining uh, evidence from these uh, two different models, the acoustic model and the language model, um, that helps us uh, figure out what somebody actually said when we're not sure exactly what we heard. So if we're in a political setting, we're probably more likely to hear Mike Pence than to hear Mike Pants. Um, so uh, laughter recognition suffers from the same problem. Um, when somebody laughs, it might sound like a word that somebody would have said or some noise in the background. So this is kind of the, the main challenge with our system was um, um, making sure we don't get uh, false positives, uh, instances of laughter. So um, in, in our case, it's kind of difficult to, to actually think about what a language model for laughter would be. Um, so in speech, you're kind of um, thinking about what, what sequences of words often come together. But with, with laughter, we would actually need to know whether a person would be likely to laugh here. And that, that's kind of difficult to model. So for our purposes, we actually just drop the language model. And so our system basically looks like this. We have an audio signal, we extract features, and then we have a deep neural network that classifies the sound as either a um, laugh or not a laugh. 
So for the representations of laughter, we came up with a few based on our design sessions and informal evaluation with people interacting with our early prototypes. We have created a couple of containers of laughter. This is our perfume bottle. Opening the lid releases a single laughter. It was important for the bottle to be small and delicate to preserve precious laughter. Our second container is a jar, which holds and releases collection of laughter. Lights flicker as it releases the collection of laughter. We also explored representations that showed both quality, quantity and quality of laughter over time. Based on our earlier explorations, we created chocolate representations, which can be admired, eaten, or gifted. We had two versions of chocolate representations. One set had chocolate towers that were built based on the quantity of laughter in given recordings. Another set had chocolate towers that not only showed quantity, but also the quality of laughter, such as belly laugh, giggle, or somewhere in the middle, expressed by the size of the circles. As a person lifts each piece of chocolate, the associated laughter sound can be heard. We originally envisioned using a chocolate 3D printer. However, the current chocolate printer does not give us enough resolution for the type of chocolate we wanted to build. So that meant we hand cut the chocolate squares, hand cut discs of chocolate with varying sizes, and assembled chocolate pieces based on the analysis of each participant's laughter data. 20 people participated in our study. Four participants returned to repeat the experience with a loved one. We asked the participants to collect about three hours of audio. They were given one week, but some participants took more than one month to finish. Once participants' audio files were uploaded and processed, we scheduled an hour-long individual meetings to discuss the results. Here are some of our results. Interviews with participants reveal that their audio files contained laughter from a variety of people in their lives, including romantic partners, family members, friends, and professional colleagues. The context for laughter varied from cuddling in bed, to family dinners, to meetings, to field trips. Next, you see a clip of a participant surprised by receiving a gift of laughter. You see a woman on the left she opens a perfume bottle and hears her own laughter collected by her best friend sitting next to her. What? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that me. Without any prompt from us, several described how listening to laughter from bottles was like letting the genie out of a bottle. For most participants, the bottle's preciousness and delicacy led them to feel that this was an object for personal and private use. Chocolates, on the other hand, were perceived as for gifting and sharing. All participants were presented with their own original set of chocolates built based on their laughter data. Here you can see the difference between one participant's chocolate, the set above, and another participant's chocolate, the set below with varying shapes and sizes and quantities. Originally, we thought the participants would be impressed with just how much laughter, as opposed to how little, some of their recordings produced. While people enjoyed seeing varying heights and shapes of the chocolates, the accuracy of such display or quantity of laughter did not seem to matter. What mattered more was how each participant reflected and personally drew relationship between the shape of the chocolate and the laughter it represented. For example, as she held the, uh, the chocolate pieces, one participant called them delicate, beautiful food. As she respectfully held a large piece of chocolate with complicated shape, she said, this one is not a particularly special moment or anything. This is kind of social throwaway laughter, nothing that sentimental, but it looks visually beautiful. On the other hand, the best piece for her that included her father's laugh was a shorter and less complicated shape, but it was equally beautiful to her. 
All participants tried the chocolate. Most expressed that the chocolate tasted sweeter than they expected. As one participant explained, you are already happy listening to the laughter, and you double it with the sweetness of chocolate. Although all chocolate pieces were made with the same dark chocolate, some participants thought that we used different flavors for different pieces, commenting, this is nuttier than the other, etc. While most participants reacted to the consumable material quality of chocolate by eating them, some reacted to its ephemerality and hesitated to eat more chocolate pieces. One said, it's very illogical not wanting to throw away something you have recorded, even though laughter gets thrown away all the time. We asked the participants about the process of capturing laughter. Most participants found the recording task to be more difficult than they anticipated. So we asked hypothetically in the future, if they could, would they want smart speakers such as Amazon's Alexa or Google Home to be capturing laughter automatically? Or would they still want to capture laughter manually? Most participants, 11 out of 16, preferred future automation as it was difficult for them to predict when laughter might happen. Participants also expressed that it would feel more natural as opposed to explicitly hitting a button to record laughter. However, three participants would still choose to record manually for privacy and security reasons. Two participants explained that they would be okay with automatic capture if it happened without connecting to the internet. Eventually, we might end up with a ton of laughter data collected over time. So we asked the participants which laughter they might choose to keep and which ones to let go. Many participants responded by wanting to selectively keep natural laughter as opposed to fake laughter. They also mentioned selectively keeping certain members of their family, such as only my daughter and my husband, but not me. In terms of letting go certain laughter, one participant had an interesting encounter. Denise found a couple of instances of laughter she was embarrassed about, later explaining that the laughter followed inappropriate jokes. When she encountered such embarrassing laughter in the chocolate, she said she was more in a rush to eat it and finish it rather than savor it. Denise said that the experience of silencing the laughter by eating it was gratifying, snapping down on something crunchy. The function of chocolate in this case added to the removal of laughter. Savoring the memory versus crunching down to eliminate memory is an interesting design opportunity. The participants also commented on the nuances of laughter and how private their laughter felt. For example, participants mentioned that their laughter changed in front of people they know well or not. As a result, they felt that their laughter should not be shared outside of their close friends and family. Some also mentioned that they would not want laughter to be quantified and displayed in social media in a way likes uh, quantified and shown on Facebook. The participants wanted the representation to reflect the level of intimacy and privacy they felt in their laughter. Therefore, the very tangibility of their laughter mattered a lot. Mary explained that having something to touch or something to eat helps it reconnect with what was depersonalized. By leaving our body, our laughter becomes disembodied. But by re-encountering laughter as a concrete embodiment, we are reunited with our laughter. Therefore, tangibility of laughter representation matters in respectfully reconnecting what was once part of us. At the same time, the representation is ensouled uh, with laughter. Lastly, we found that the laughter reflection is both personal and social experience. Some enjoyed sharing laughter with loved ones, like a game or a puzzle of shared memory. For some, this was an opportunity to preserve laughter more privately, like creating a time capsule with one's baby's laughter. Some takeaway and future work. While most participants enjoy listening to pure laughter, for some, 
background noise also played an important role by reminding them of the context. The question of how much context to include, for example, a few seconds of audio before or after the laughter, is a delicate balance. Too much would detract from the laughter, making the recordings more about the conversation than the laughter. As a future work, providing customizable settings uh, for accessing context might be a solution. Issues of privacy made the process of capturing laughter challenging for many of our participants. Informing our loved ones about recording and getting consent is mandatory, but once the consent has been obtained, starting the recording automatically with or without letting the partner know could be a separate design issue. More study is needed to better understand the issue of privacy and security in capturing naturally occurring laughter. We started to reveal what laughter representation is not about. Initially, we imagined that people might want to celebrate moments of their life when they laughed a lot, like an accomplishment. However, our studies show that more laughter did not always mean more memorable or happier moments. Instead, what people valued was the ensoulment of object with their loved one's laughter. And finally, the tangibility and durability of a laughter representation matters as it serves to reconstrue what was once disembodied into a concrete reminder of happy lived moments that people can preserve or share with others. Thanks. So we have uh, time for a couple questions. Please use the microphone uh, in the middle of the room to ask questions. And please state your name and affiliation before you ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I have one question, actually. So you mentioned that you consider using a 3D printer to actually generate <coughs> chocolate, but the resolution is not uh, good enough right now. Um, what if in the future a 3D printer is good enough to like uh, make a chocolate? What kind of thing you want to use a 3D printer to print out like chocolate other than quantity and the size of uh, all the duration of the laughter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, as a group, we did explore different types, different designs of chocolate. Um, so instead of just um, having a, a quantity, maybe a different <coughs> wavy patterns or uh, splatting patterns and um, also different members mm -hmm. of the family or different partners might have different patterns or designs. Um, I think we have a lot of interesting design possibilities. Um, but given that uh, restriction of having to handmade these, um, we came up with pretty simple design. Um, but we're looking forward to the future work. Hi, <coughs> sorry. I'm Hiroshi Ishii from MIT Media. So thanks to Kimiko, very poetic, nice, not only tangible, but also very social. Uh, my question is, laughter is a great way to start, but have you tried poem or haiku? Also, the poem or haiku written or read by the deceased person? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, again, the containers of laughter was inspired by music bottle. Um, and uh, originally, we did try to think about, again, like different context that the laughter happened. And um, laughter of a, of a deceased person is definitely something that we thought about. We decided to focus on the laughter because HCI hasn't really focused on the sound of the laughter yet, so we wanted to give it a try with this. Um, but uh, poems, whether it's associated with laughter or not, is definitely something that we um, can think of in the future, have not explored yet. Thank you for the